I think they're both at fault. I don't think it should have gone out on an official Chinese tweet. It should have come from some other source. But Morrison, I think, has overreacted totally. I think Morrison and, in fact, our entire political leadership, they're guilty of not really understanding statecraft. The overwhelming majority of the messaging that goes up across our nation is controlled by Rupert Murdoch, harnessed by the Five Eyes intelligence agencies and just part and parcel of this 80-year strong tsunami of propaganda, of messaging. China as a nation, going back 5,000 years of culture and contribution to civilization on this planet, Deng Xiaoping saying it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. So inevitably, Australia will wake up, China will make adjustments and quietly, quietly things will go back to where they are and I think the RCEP is a, a good solid indication of China's intentions in relation to this. Hey guys, it's Keith Rose. Welcome to a new episode of Soft Talk, where unlike BBC's Hard Talk, the interviewees won't find it hard to talk. Make sure to give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to Keybros by pressing the red button below. Today, we're very honored to have two guests from Australia. They are Mark and Stephen. Mark actually was the former chief information officer of the Hong Kong government, while Stephen is an expert in visa and immigration policies, and they're both Australian expats here in Hong Kong. In fact, two of our loyal subscribers and also they regularly watch our programs. So Mark and Stephen, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience? At age before beauty, sir. Mark, over to you. <laughs> I like your humour. Okay. okay. Mark Pinkston, I've been a resident in Hong Kong for 50 years or a bit more. I served at the Hong Kong government uh, in the British colonial days uh, for almost 20 years. Since then, I've been sort of freelance uh, journalism. Because of my background with the Hong Kong government, or well, I was basically chief spokesman for many of the policy issues. I was the secretary of press officer, which meant that I was meeting with the policy secretaries every day. So I had a pretty good insight into how the government was running and the thought that went behind government policies. Stephen, you have a go. Okay, great stuff, guys. Before I um, get into what I'm all about, I just want to compliment you on your good work. I've been a, a loyal fan since I discovered your channel. I've listened to everything that you've had to say, all your guests, and uh, you bring a much needed voice in the platform to, you know, the, the, the true spirit of Hong Kong's youth that's, that's been here all throughout, even though it had been temporarily hijacked, uh, I think, as we'll sort of come to understand from this conversation today. I'm Stephen Barnes. Um, I'm an immigration uh, lawyer here in Hong Kong. I've been practicing uh, this discipline since I got out of law school in 1993. Uh, so I've seen every aspect of Hong Kong immigration basically since, you know, just in the run into the handover and beyond. Actually, I've had a close association with Hong Kong since 1984. Um, at the end of 2000, I relocated my young family who were born and bred here to Western Australia because I wanted uh, a place where my children could run around with grass under their feet. Uh, eight, nine years ago, I was privileged to finally qualify for Australian citizenship. I was born in the UK. I've always been a better Australian than an Englishman, but, um, but I am actually proud of my English roots. Thank you very much. Without further ado, let's begin with the first question. So the relationship between Australia and China is at an all-time low at the moment. The most notable incident in recent times is the spats between the Chinese Foreign Ministry and Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison over a controversial tweet exposing Australia's war crimes in Afghanistan. What is your view on this saga? Do you think Australia or China is at fault? Actually, I think they're both at fault. The illustration, which has offended everybody, is actually a satire drawing, not photoshopped as Morrison first thought it was. It's very similar to the Charlie Ebel drawings of the Muslims in France. The Prime Ministers there have described it as uh, free speech. What I see is wrong there is that I don't think it should have gone out on an official Chinese tweet. It should have come from some other source, but coming from a official channels, I think, is what got up the back of, of Morrison. Morrison, I think, has overreacted totally. 
But Morrison has changed a bit in, in recent days. He's been throwing out the olive branch to China. He thanks China, for example, on taking the country out of poverty. So I think Morrison is starting to tone down a bit now. And I hope that there'll be nothing further from China on this. I'll just let the issue die. I think Morrison and, in fact, our entire political leadership, they're guilty of not really understanding statecraft. A democracy like we have in Australia, there, there are three tiers of interest. You've got the voters who want one thing and expect one thing. You've got the politicians themselves who really just want something that's different from the voters. And then you've got the constant who are the administrators who have got to implement the sometime folly that politicians insist on having implemented. When you get right down to it, it's the administration level that's the constant by the intelligence agencies. And the intelligence agencies have a, a vitally important role to play in the protection of the national interest. What I think has been going on with Morrison and his cohort is that because they are political babes in the wood for all practical purposes, they've bought into the line that they've been told is the line that prevails and is ultimately going to be in Australia's best interests. And it results in the behaviour that you've seen out of Morrison, not just in recent times, but for probably a year or two at least. The relationship has been less than ideal between Australia and China. And this is just another example of a spat that results from Morrison and his gang not truly sort of knowing how to play the game, notwithstanding the fact that they've had 80 years of Western propaganda perfection. And then you got the Chinese who are always interested in looking inward and making sure everything's safe at home. And they've never really mastered any kind of international diplomacy, nor have they really had to master any major international diplomacy because they're not projecting outwards. And so I think what we've seen here is a combination of naivety on the part of China and also Morrison not really being up to the task of managing what's a very important relationship for us. So just like the US, Australia is currently engaging in the trade war with China. China imposed an anti-dumping tariff on Australian wine, 212%, beef, 12%, and also barley, around 80%. Meanwhile, Australia has also done similar tariffs for Chinese aluminum, for example, 144%, and also other major steel products. So what do you make of this trade war? Do you think it can be resolved in the future? This is why they call the issue now as a Cold War. Instead of using military arms and so forth to fight a war, they're using trade. This is a softer approach, but it's a Cold War. It's all tit for tat, like 212%. For wine is absolutely ridiculous. It's going to hurt the Australian wine growers considerably. And they're now enticing other Australians to drink more, make up on the losses. A lot of this has actually started from the US because of the issues that are going on there. It's having ramifications throughout the whole world. I think that next year, Hopefully, with a new administration in the US, things will be toned down a lot of the rhetoric that's been going on. Now, what's happened is that Australia is very much following the rules of the, the Five Eyes, which is predominated by the Americans, the Big Daddy. Okay, we agree with you, so we'll uh, bombard China again, and China will say, we're going to put up more tariffs on you. But hopefully, we'll get back to a bit of normality next year. Concur with you, Mark. The only thing that I would add to that is that China's our biggest uh, neighbour and trade partner. China will leverage whatever it's got available to it to reflect its best interests and seek to bring about a change in behaviour that's clearly designed to be negative upon Chinese nation. So if China wants to pick up its ball and go home and leave all the players on the field without a ball to kick, that's what they will do. But real politic will play its way through. Trade has proven to be a great keeper of peace amongst great nations. You only have to look at the establishment of the European Union to understand what that's all about. So inevitably, Australia will wake up, China will make adjustments, and quietly, quietly, things will go back to where they are. And I think the RCEP is a, a good, solid indication of China's intentions in relation to this. According to the survey conducted by the Pew Research Center, a staggering 81% of Australians have a negative view of China. Why do you think both the liberals and conservatives in Australia hate China? What are the reasons for this constant China bashing, both in the Australian media and just in day-to-day -day life in Australia? This goes back to a long history. It stems from, again, in the US, we call the Carthy Syndrome, was a senator that was afraid of communism taking over the United States. And he started a big 
hate campaign. That's how it spread to the other parts of the world that you cannot trust China because it is a communist state. That's not the case because I don't think that with the Milton Road initiative, there's been no evidence of China trying to instill communism with any of the partners that overseas. Steve and I, we both have friends in Australia. I've got one group of friends that will read an Australian newspaper. After reading the story about Hong Kong, they'll ring me up and say, is that story true? Or say, no, it's not. And this is the real facts. And there's the other group of friends in Australia, and, and mainly journalist friends, who say it is true because it's in the press. It's in the Australian, the Sydney Morning Herald and what have you. They're very, very hard. I have a lot of arguments with them. Will ring me up as those that have been in Hong Kong before. And they've seen Hong Kong for what it is, a very progressive city. But other friends in Hong Kong as well, which will verify what I say. Those that stick to the Australian press, this is all media-led, except for a couple of them who have been in China, worked in China. All the rest have never been to Hong Kong and haven't got a clue. So they're listening to the old rhetoric that communist China is going to take over. They're afraid, actually afraid of the power which China has been generating, mainly through the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's what scares them, that China is going to be the power player uh, in the world. I think the answer is very straightforward. It's the Murdoch Press represents 70 percent of our print media or significant reach through Sky. Overwhelming majority of the messaging that goes up across our nation is controlled by Rupert Murdoch, harnessed by the Five Eyes intelligence agencies and just part and parcel of this 80 year strong tsunami of propaganda, of messaging. We understand Australian ethics. We understand the fair go. My wife is Japanese. My children are, are Eurasian, but they are Australians. We, we've never encountered any racism. We haven't encountered any sort of negative consequences of being part and parcel of a uh, majority white but still very multi multicultural society. Yeah, you know, at the peak of the propaganda messaging, I'm getting messages from people just like Mark is, and, and they're saying things that are clearly a result of the propaganda that they've been exposed to, citing verbatim that, you know, the CCP is evil. These are rational actors that I've known for a long time and I've got a, trust, a lot of trust and respect for. And so they, they've basically just been messaged into it. But the spirit and the ethos of Australia is, is, is very contrary to what you might perceive press would have Australians think about uh, China at all. If nothing else, we're, we're practical, right? And when a third of your economy is driven from your biggest neighbour to the north and who are going to be the ascending power for the next hundred years, you've got to sort of, you know, play the game and listen to them and, and, and respect them and, and do it properly. That's not happening at the moment for, you know, primarily the reason that Mark mentioned right at the beginning. It's all, it's all driven by the US. Australia have banned Chinese telecommunication companies Huawei and ZTE. What is your view on this ban by your government? Is it against the free market principles of Australia? Do you see Huawei and ZTE to be a national security threat to your nation? I'm not a technocrat, so I don't know how they bug into different people and governments and all the rest of it. But as a layman, I find it an infringement of the free market policies in Australia and uh, China. Again, I blame the United States for this. They're the ones that have started the Huawei issue that have virtually kidnapped the vice chairman, Adam Meng, who's held up in Canada at the moment, with the uh, Chinese government to release her if she pleads guilty. I don't think she will. It should be silly if she did. They say they have evidence that Huawei will tap into their security issues. What evidence they have, we don't know. They won't tell us. We wish they would give us a bit more. I think this is the way they're trying to close down Huawei, which they will never do because Huawei is far too big for them. Personally, I don't see it as a national threat. It could be, I don't know. I'm not really appraised of the technical machinations of you know, this entire scenario, but in a sense, the fact that the average normal human being wouldn't be able to make sense of whether there's any real security risk uh, or not in this sort of speaks to the kind of platform that we're operating on. It's always a case that countries are going to try to protect and project their national interests. And uh, I think this technology game is uh, low hanging fruit for uh, the Five Eyes security agencies to set that as an agenda item. That notwithstanding, the challenge that's going on with Huawei in relation to Australia, whether it's a good decision or a bad decision or not, 
you know, you've got the American actors, guys like Peter Thiel, a very famous VC in Silicon Valley, founder of PayPal, founder of uh, Palantir, who are the fastest growing provider of services to Western intelligence agencies. Peter Thiel is, is on record of having contributed funds to an offshoot of the National Endowment for Democracy, a CIA regime change propaganda organ. Few are running a major technology company in the West that has the technological capability to deliver an intelligence asset to the intelligence services, then, you know, these very sophisticated operators are going to come up to the owners of these companies and sort of wave the flag in front of them and say, hey, you know, if you're a proud American or a proud Brit, you know, you're going to have to sort of do our bidding because, you know, the enemy are bad guys. No surprises that we hear constantly things like the US have been running an organization in Switzerland recently for the last 25 years or so that was a clearinghouse for security certificates that was ostensibly neutral in nature that had access to vast amounts of, uh, of data and information that would allow intelligence decisions to be made out of an organ in, uh, in Switzerland. Well, you know, where's the hue and the cry and the upshot about all of that? There's plenty of examples of this kind of stuff going on. And as I say, it's very difficult to know whether or not there's any merit in uh, the security risk. But certainly uh, the Aussie polys have bought into it and, you know, they're beating that drum. Australia has also massively criticised China's human rights records from the detainment of Australian journalists in China to the alleged concentration camps in Xinjiang. And also the origins of COVID-19 and the South China Sea dispute are also sources of tension between the two countries. What do you think of these human rights criticisms? Do you think they are justified? The charge that's leveled against China is it's authoritarian compared to, and then you cite various political systems elsewhere and sort of versus Western democracy. But, Underlying that is this sort of historical reality that China as a nation, going back 5,000 years of culture and contribution to civilization on this planet, they've never been able to hold themselves together. And it wasn't until the Chinese Communist Party came along and was actually able to represent that centralizing force that allowed the nation to be held together that actually China finally began to prosper. And then in 1989, we had Deng Xiaoping saying it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice. Or in a sense, Western market liberalism was brought to China to deliver a uh, benefit to the Chinese people. The cost of this, I suppose, are the rules and regulations that have gone to deliver the amazing progress that China's been able to deliver its people over the last 40 years. So you can call that authoritarian, if you like. But um, again, I think that uh, this notional authority authoritarianism that's projected onto the Chinese uh, government uh, has just become wrapped up in this miasma of different propaganda messaging. But yeah, for all practical purposes, I think the difficulty that China faces in terms of having this authoritarian label is that um, A, they have notionally had to become authority in order to deliver results, and B, they don't have the propaganda response that, uh, that the Five Eyes nations have been throwing at the country for well, since the establishment. So, so it's hardly surprising, but again, none of that actually changes any facts on the ground. The reality is that, that China continues to progress and is doing you know, good things for its people and is concentrating on holding itself together. Otherwise, you see the propensity for the Chinese I think a cultural trait that makes it very difficult to compromise and to stand down, you know, the whole idea of face, for example. I mean, you only have to look at, at grannies that will be screaming and shouting at each other in the streets. And I heard a couple of years ago, there was some, some, a couple of old ladies in some remote Chinese province who both collapsed after going at it for about 10 hours nonstop in the heat. So, so yeah. I travel very parts of China a fair bit. One of my favorite places is um, Xi'an, the Central West. And it has a very, very high Muslim population. And there's one particular street, which is called Muslim Street. And you get on this street and they're all doing their cooking and so forth. They've all got their little skull caps on. And, and they live happily, freely. There's been no persecution. COVID issues, for example, again, it's not proven. Now they're saying, and this is where Morrison has got himself into a lot of trouble as well, by sticking with the, the Americans asking for an immediate investigation. The priority for every country in the world is to get rid of COVID and to take them away from, the, from this uh, and to, to go for a, an investigation at this stage is when they should be concentrating wholly and solely on prevention. 
China has agreed with WHO that it would take part in an investigation. We must also look at this, there have been other suggestions that it could have started in the US, it could have started in Italy. Nobody knows exactly yet, but they're still, because of the Americans, are still blaming China for it. I want to give uh, a um, word to Nuri Vitacci and his new book, The Other Side of the Story, because it's extremely factual, told me a lot about what was going on, and recommend all your viewers uh, get a hold of this copy and read it uh, for an objective view of what actually went on. This marks the end of part one of our Australian episode of Soft Talk. In part two, we'll be discussing our Australian expat friends' view on the situation here in Hong Kong. They have really good insights since they've lived through both the colonial periods and the current times for more than 30 to 40 years here. So please stay tuned and see you in the next episode. Bye.